Welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Ben Data, co-chair of DSW. This year marks the 10-year anniversary of Denver Startup Week. This community has been the catalyst for lots of change over the past decade. And this week, we're coming together to celebrate the past and dream big for the future. We are able to bring Denver Startup Week to this community thanks to our 2021 sponsors. Thank you to our HQ and title sponsor, Amazon, and our title sponsors, whose leadership makes this week come to life. Capital One Cafe, Downtown Denver Partnership, Fluid Truck, Hotel Engine, and WeWork. And our track sponsors, who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible. Founder Track, Kickstart, Growth Track, Friday Health Plans, Developer Track, Quizlet, Product Track, Palantir, Designer Track, Battery 621 in the Public Works, People Track, Exactly, and Spotlight Events sponsor, Strat Labs. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement this week. Thank you to B-Side Fund, Colorado Public Radio, Comcast, Coors Brewing Company, Denver Pavilions, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver, Gusto, J.P. Morgan Chase, Method, Moss Adams, Pine Insurance, Promontory Mortgage Path, Red Bull Basement, Southwest, Tattered Cover, and VF Venture Foundry. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors listed on the screen. Please say thank you to these companies as you enjoy our hybrid Denver Startup Week. And don't forget to use hashtag Den Startup Week to share your experience and moments of inspiration on social media. Have a great week. Early risers, all-nighters, slow pours, fast crams, post-nap, on the mat, in the stacks, phone down, volume up, complete silence. You ups, coffee cups, pizza crusts, first semester, fourth quarter, focus 100, privacy zero, pre-test, one last check, let's go. However you study, Quizlet takes the guesswork out of your coursework. Learn it, own it, Quizlet. Hello everyone, welcome to Denver Startup Week. I'm Connor Swanson, the developer track co-chair along with Aaron Clark and member of the Denver Startup Week organizing committee. Thank you for joining us for the 10th anniversary of Denver Startup Week. At Denver Startup Week, we strive to make all of our sessions a space where attendees can connect, learn, and grow, regardless of age, gender identity, gender expression, race, ability, or sexual orientation. A special thank you to all of our sponsors for their support in helping us to keep DSW free and accessible for all. Thank you for joining us and have a great week. Sorry, <laughs> muted. <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome to the talk. Okay, man, uh, some real world lessons learned here. So let's go over to gender real quick. Uh, I'm gonna go over intro, let you guys know who I am, why I know about KMM. Uh, we'll go into some basics about KMM in general, what it is, um, how projects are organized and some of the key uh, keywords involved there, as well as some of uh, the team organization aspects around it. We'll dive into some specifics about Kotlin Native uh, that can impact your decision about whether or not to use KMM. And then we'll talk about the actual decision itself. And then assuming you do decide to use it, we'll get into what it actually looks like to start a new project with KMM, as well as touch on uh, integrating it into existing projects. And then we'll dive into some of the real world sort of uh, nuances that you might encounter as your team adopts it or starts a new project with it. And then lastly, we'll go over some Q&A if any folks have any questions. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm a principal mobile engineer over at Parcel in Denver. Uh, I actually live in Minnesota. I uh, used to live in Denver for about 10 years. I'm out here in Minnesota now where I grew up. So um, mobile engineer here. Before that, I was at uh, Go Spot Check, which is now part of Form. And I was a lead software engineer there doing uh, mobile uh, most mobile, but some front end, some back end, a little bit of everything. Before that, I was at TW Telecom out in Lone Tree, which is now part of L3. 
I was a back-end engineer out there and way back I was at Lockheed Martin up in Boulder and uh, Littleton doing back-end and defense programs. So hopefully that gives you some context about why I'm talking about KMM here. Let's also talk about uh, what Parcel does here just because it's sort of relevant to talk. Um, so what does Parcel do? Basically uh, we build this modern risk management and insurance uh, solution for perishable goods. Uh, anything from like frozen uh, fresh foods and perishable foods that are moving across the ocean uh, between a couple warehouses here in town, doesn't matter. Uh, and we also do things like vaccines and parts of the, uh, the cold supply chain that you've heard so much about in the uh, COVID era here. And the way it works is we have these little devices called Trex and they're essentially just packaged up sensors. They collect data. We have our mobile apps that help uh, move the data from these sensors up to our back end and help you view some of the more actionable data that's on the sensors. Uh, and then we also have IoT gateways that help shuffle that data as well. And then once the data is uploaded, then you can view all the data in our back end and mobile apps as well. So KMM okay, applies to us here because we build both our Android and iOS apps off of it. All right. So Let's just briefly touch on some of the basics of KMM here, uh, just to sort of set the stage for the talk. So we're going to touch on KMM itself, what it actually is, uh, project organization, expect an actual keywords here, since they're such an integral part of the experience, and uh, team organization. So KMM at its core here, right, is a common set of Kotlin code that is packaged up and it's, it's sort of platform agnostic, right? It doesn't reference any particular libraries, binaries, platform specific stuff. It, it just, it's pure Kotlin. Then on top of that, you have this uh, platform sort of specific layer that is still Kotlin code, but uh, is tailored to the particular platform that the code is running on. So the most common ones, the ones I'll talk about here uh, are the JVM for Android and native for iOS. Uh, JS and Windows and some others are also uh, potential targets there, but they don't apply to KMM specifically. Then lastly, of course, you have the platform's actual native language and code, right? That needs to be able to interface with your Kotlin code. So you may have actual Java or JVM specific Kotlin on the Android side of things and Objective-C and Swift on the iOS side of things that need to be able to interrupt seamlessly with your Kotlin. So how does that actually work, right? Um, well, number one, there are some Gradle and Android Studio plugins that uh, help you set up the project structure necessary for this, as well as the build pipeline for it. Uh, the, the goal here is that you're like not trying to get rid of iOS and Android's strengths. You're, you're, we're playing to the strengths of Android and iOS, as in keeping their native UIs that we all love. And let's be real, most of us don't like the non-native UIs. Uh, so KMM aims to essentially let you leverage all that stuff, all the code you've written UI-wise for that, uh, while also giving you the benefits of a true multi-platform setup where you can share the business logic, uh, squash bugs once, write features once, stuff like that. So physically what's going on there is those Gradle and Android Studio plugins are helping you compile your cross-platform or multi-platform code in Kotlin down to the actual native environment, right? So um, in iOS, you're actually producing binaries and in Android, you're producing actual JVM bytecode. And of course your code can interact with the, the platforms themselves. The best part about that is you get to take advantage of the platform specific features, right? So, so you have, um, so your app gets locations, right? Uh, of, the, of the device it's running on, then you can leverage uh, iOS's native location stuff or Android's native location stuff and fine tune and tweak it however you like without having to, to sacrifice anything there or rely on a third party API. So when you're breaking this, the project structure down, this is generally what it looks like, right? You have a, your top level project route, you have an Android app module and an iOS app module, as well as a shared module. Modules in this context are just groupings of files that are compiled independently. 
So in your Android app module, you'll have all the actual Android app specific code that, that never touches anything or never references anything from the shared side. The same goes for iOS. You can think of these two modules as having like most of your view layer type stuff and any specific platform stuff that doesn't have to do with shared code at all. Then the shared module itself contains everything that is shared. So both the common Kotlin code that is platform agnostic, as well as the platform specific code that ties in to the platform agnostic common code. And that's where these different source sets come in. So all the different uh, you know, platform specific and common folders here underneath your shared one are called source sets. Uh, your platform agnostic and what's called expect code, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, belongs in the common main source set. And then any platform specific and actual code, uh, which is the sort of counterpart to the expect, belongs in Android main or iOS main. And then, of course, each one of these has its own sort of corresponding test source set. So what are expect and actual? Uh, basically, they're the mechanism that KMM gives you to have platform specific code that ties into your platform agnostic or common code. So pretend I have a, a, a data class in Kotlin, uh, sort of similar to a struct or something in Swift um, that just holds two values, right? Uh, a latitude and a longitude for a pair of coordinates. And then we might have a, an expect class to stick with our location analogy from earlier uh, called locator. And it has a function called locate that returns some coordinates. Now, uh, your, your actual Android uh, main source set there will contain an actual class locator and your iOS one will have an actual class locator as well. The difference being that the actual class in each source set can reference all the the uh, platform specific code. So on the Android side, you might use something like location manager. Oh, I'm sorry. Just realized I wasn't sure. One sec here. Okay. All right, here we go. Sorry about that, guys. So let's back up real quick. So here's the modules. You can see the Android app, iOS app module, and shared module. And then you can see the, the source sets I mentioned underneath the shared module. And then there's your coordinates and locator examples. And we'll dive specifically into the actuals here. So actual class-wise for the uh, locator, you'll have a locate function that references Android-specific platform code, right? You'll use like location manager or a fuse location provider client, something like that. On the iOS side, you're gonna be tying into Apple's libraries. And if you want third-party libraries as well, and that holds true for Android as well. So you might use something like uh, Core Locations Location Manager. Now there's a gotcha here. You'll notice the asterisk on the third-party libraries. Uh, you can kind of use third-party libraries. So we'll touch on that a little bit later. All right, so now how about the team organization part? Um, well, when you think about this, like you have to decide who works on what code, right? You're gonna have uh, some Android specific code, some iOS specific code and some shared code, as well as uh, shared code that touches each specific platform. So a couple of things to consider here are the size of your team or teams that are gonna be using your KMM code base, uh, the level of Kotlin expertise that individual teams or members of those teams actually have, like some folks might not be able to write the Kotlin code or desire to write the Kotlin code for that matter. Uh, that touches on the cross-pollination bit here too, right? Some team members uh, might be only interested in one platform's code and might not care about writing multi-platform code uh, or, plat or code for the other platform. So uh, consider that, you know, and make that part of your team's decision to uh, use KMM. And uh, lastly, consider that you're gonna be writing APIs for both Android and iOS here. So this isn't like a, an Android first thing, right? It might be Kotlin, but the goal here and the goal for your team should not be to like make Kotlin the first class citizen and leave iOS to sort of just figure it out. That's not what we're trying to do here. You're all in this together. And so we want to just make sure that we're being considerate of both sides of the house and designing APIs that work well for both sides. So 
let's dive into the, the whole work well bit here. Uh, on Kotlin native, you have a couple special considerations for KMM. There's dependencies, uh, suspend functions, and memory management to consider. So let's dig into the dependencies first. I mentioned that little asterisk uh, from before. So essentially, KMM code can only tie into and interoperate with Objective-C dependencies and Swift dependencies if their APIs are exported with the Objective-C attribute here. Um, pure Swift dependencies are just straight up not supported. This is called out explicitly on Collins documentation. Uh, one of the nice things here, though, is they do give you integration with CocoaPods. Uh, however, the same thing applies. So even if you have a pure Swift CocoaPod, uh, it's, it's not going to pull in just because it's a CocoaPod. It still has to be exported. The next piece to consider is suspending functions. So in Kotlin, uh, we have this thing called structured concurrency. And suspend functions are really the way that uh, that structured concurrency is achieved. So when you call a suspend function, uh, essentially the, the coroutine, or it's like a lightweight thread that uh, the code is running in, uh, suspends, and then that suspend function executes in some other thread in a different coroutine. And then uh, the code comes back, returns, and carries on with the value returned by the suspend function, right? It's a really nice way to write uh, sensible multi-threaded code or parallel code. However, Swift and Objective-C just don't even have suspend functions here. So what Kotlin is doing under the hood is uh, taking your suspend functions and creating versions of them for use in Swift and Objective-C that have completion handlers. So uh, you might have a, a non-suspending function call. Imagine we have a greeter with, with, uh, with two types of greet functions here. You have a, a regular greet function that's not suspending, and then you have a, a suspending greet, pretend it like does some background work uh, before it can actually do the greeting uh, that has to run in a different coroutine. On, on Colin, this would like literally be, or on the JVM, sorry, this would literally be a totally separate thread. Uh, that is not necessarily how it works or not, not directly um, and obviously how it works on the Swift side. So you have these completion handlers uh, and it's sort of more of a, a callback based mechanism. All right, and then there's memory management. So Kotlin Native uses an actual runtime garbage collector. Um, and one of the, the caveats here is that when you cross, when data specifically crosses a coroutine boundary, it needs to be frozen. And they do this, uh, JetBrains has chosen to do this in order to make uh, mutability sensible across multiple threads. So essentially when an object crosses that coroutine or thread boundary, you cannot mutate it anymore. That sounds all fine and dandy. Uh, however, it's not always super obvious that certain things are going to be frozen. So consider this example. You have this function, and it takes this input. And uh, within that function, you have a coroutine scope. Think of this as like a, uh, a life cycle within which you can launch coroutines. And when that scope goes out of scope, then coroutines launch in it die or canceled. So uh, in this do some stuff function, we launch a coroutine and uh, we call save the database and we pass it input. Then later on outside of the scope of our coroutine here, we try to mutate that input parameter that we passed to our function. At that mutate call time, you're going to get this invalid mutability exception because you can't mutate frozen objects. Um, Cool. That sort of makes sense, right? Uh, the thing that doesn't make sense here, though, is that the actual block that is passed to launch itself is frozen and the parameter input is frozen. So what this practically means is you end up getting these invalid mutability exceptions that are sort of confusing as a developer first getting into KMM, but that are there to really save you. So while, yes, this is annoying. It's Kotlin actually doing a good job of keeping us safe and, and sane with uh, multi-threading and mutable data. So the nice thing here, though, is that this actually isn't too bad to fix. 
So there are a couple of techniques you can follow uh, to, to sort of prevent these scenarios and, and or deal with them when you do find them. Number one, you can use this ensure never frozen function. Uh, this sort of takes the the invalid mutability exception and changes it from an exception that crops up at mutation time to one that occurs at freeze time, which makes it a little bit more sensible when reasoning about the call stack and trying to figure out where was my data frozen and, and why. So this function is a big help. Next, you can just use atomics. Um, atomics basically are thread safe uh, mutable state, right? Or they can help you create thread safe mutable state. And so um, passing around atomics, the, the data inside the atomic is, is still mutable. There's a great library out there called Stately written by uh, Touch Lab, which is a, a company that focuses solely on KMM these days. And, and uh, they're a dev shop, a, a contract firm that uh, can help you and your company figure out how to do some KMM code if you're interested in it. But the nice part here is they publish the Stately library that uh, includes implementations of freeze and ensure never frozen, as well as a few other functions uh, that you can actually reference in common code. So normally ensure never frozen and freeze are only referenceable in your native code because freezing doesn't occur on the JVM. These let you do it in common code and they're essentially just no ops when they're called on the JVM. Now, lastly, uh, this is really sort of the, the end all for this invalid mutability exception stuff. There's a new memory manager that is available for preview now. Uh, KMM is rather young. It's still actively evolving. JetBrains um, is in very active development on it. And so there are frequent updates. And one of them that we've been waiting for for a long time is this new memory manager that basically eliminates invalid mutability exceptions. Uh, so you just don't have to think about it. This is a pretty complex topic. Uh, so feel free to check out these links here if you're looking for more specifics, more detailed information than I'm giving you here. Um, KMM's documentation is, is really solid and thorough, easy to understand too. Mm -hmm. uh, then lastly, Kevin Galligan, uh, the guy from Touch Lab, the company I just mentioned, he's got a great blog post on this uh, that also includes a YouTube video. So feel free to touch up, uh, check out that Touch Lab link there at the bottom. Okay, so knowing all of this, you have to think about some of the stuff that uh, really helps you get down to like brass tacks and make the decision or not to use KMM. So a couple of questions that I know I found um, us asking ourselves and I think are just wise to ask in general are, are right here. So do you have a legitimate need? You know, we don't want to introduce complexity into a code base where you just don't actually need it, right? KMM, Number one, it has a learning curve. And uh, number two, it just has some sort of weight to it. And you don't want your team unnecessarily car carrying around that weight over time. So ask yourself, like, is this actually going to help me solve a problem or prevent a problem, like, say, uh, business logic diverging across my platforms? Or am I just going to be adding in complexity and hence risk to my code base? Uh, Similarly, you know, is this juice worth the squeeze? Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into setting up a KMM project. Of course, the benefits can be huge, uh, but there's the initial upfront work and there's also the long-term work, right? Like the team has to um, essentially make sure that they're thinking sensibly about, hey, does this paradigm uh, exist or should it exist on both platforms after, you know, Think some more about the specific KMM interrupts that you might not have to worry about if you were to just write code separately. Being forced to do that is also one of the benefits of KMM. So lastly, you know, it's just not perfect yet. It's, it's a new technology. Uh, JetBrains has been very really good about, uh, you know, continuing development on it and trying to ensure really developer from the experience, um, but it's, it's still young. Next, uh, you know, kind of take everything that uh, the team has been able to sort of learn about KMM into consideration. You know, you're likely to have team members that just feel differently about KMM uh, and the benefits and uh, the cons that come with it. So have team discussions about it, you know, uh, make sure everyone gets a chance to chime in uh, and just listen carefully and don't dismiss each other. Everyone's got valid opinions that deserve to be heard. Then the last thing is like, 
actually think about who will write and maintain the shared code. You know, I talked about this earlier, so I'm not going to go back into the details here, but it's a team effort. And uh, there are different ways of doing this that benefit different teams of different structures and, and uh, different goals. So think about that and actively talk about it as a team. Okay, so pretend that you and your team have decided, yep, we're in for KMM. This sounds really cool. Let's get the specifics of actually how we do that. So starting a new KMM project is, is really simple here. I'm guessing not a lot of people are doing this, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but the basics here are install Android Studio, install the KMM plugin, and then create a new project from the KMM application template that is now available in the new project dialog. Really simple. It's not too different actually for using KMM for existing projects. So you create a new KMM project in a totally separate directory, or this is how we did it and it worked out well for us. Uh, you can then essentially move all of uh, the, the directory structure from that new KMM project into your existing project. And your existing project, you know, if it's iOS code, for example, all the, the code for that project gets embedded into this iOS app module. And if it's Android code, you embed it into the Android app module. It's, it's just that simple. Um, then you just start writing shared code for both platforms. And the cool thing here is that your Android app and iOS app modules are, are like literally just the same exact thing they were before you were using KMM. So you can still use Xcode for working on everything within your iOS app module, for example. And of course, you're in Android Studio for this. So you can continue using that for everything in your Android app module the same way you've always used it. So once you actually start writing your, your app, uh, be it new or, or uh, shared here, you're gonna come across some questions and, and topics and issues that just sort of consistently hit you. So the, the biggest one, first of all, is like deciding where code should live. You know, like, is this shared code? Is it platform specific code? Uh, is it both? Like it's a shared concept, but it's platform specific implementation. The next is dependencies, right? So there are lots of things like testing, logging, uh, persistence, networking, all sorts of stuff like that, that uh, we just tend to do in most, if not all apps. And um, some of these concepts can be shared across uh, both platforms using KMM and whether you want to or not is up to you, but the bottom line is you can, and I'll give you some examples of how. And then lastly, there are just some best practices to consider uh, just to ease, ease development for your team. So when thinking about where code should live, I find it generally useful to ask two questions. Number one is the idea itself behind the code common to all the platforms you're developing for. Uh, if it isn't, then okay, it just lives in some specific platform module, right? Uh, but if it is common to all platforms, should the actual implementation be common, right? It might be platform specific implementation, it might not be. So this is basically the same idea, but in a flowchart, right? You've got common idea, common implementation, drop it in the common main module or common main source set, sorry, in the shared module. Uh, common idea, but it's Android or specific, iOS specific, then sorry, not common idea, but Android uh, or iOS specific, put it in the appropriate module there and the app module, not the uh, source set in the common one. If it's common implementation, of course, we mentioned it goes in common main. If it's not though, then you just put it in the platform specific source set within your common module, your shared module. So as far as dependencies go, uh, the story here is actually pretty good. There are a lot of the basics covered here uh, for all sorts of things, like I mentioned before, logging, networking, persistence, all that good stuff. Um, there are across the board, uh, like a few sort of missing, really nice to have things, but you can get done almost anything you need to get done. It just might take a little bit of extra work. And then it's worth mentioning too, that the most commonly supported platforms right now uh, are of course, JVM and Android, uh, and then native. So the number of libraries that are supporting multiple platforms 
um, is growing every single day. Uh, there's lots of active contribution in, in this realm. So uh, don't be surprised if uh, you start to see more and more options pop up here, but already there are some uh, separations from the rest of the pack that you're starting to see uh, in the ecosystem where there's some really high quality libraries that support both. Uh, lastly, it's worth mentioning here that open source maintainers, I mean, they're always pretty open to discussion if you're on open source. Um, but I think this is just especially true in the KMM realm. You know, it, it's a uh, still very early days for KMM and people are eager to include support for multiple platforms and level up that support. So if you start to use KMM and you find out like, oh man, this library looks really nice. There's this particular feature that uh, happens to be missing then, you know, talk to the, the maintainer of that repo and uh, create a PR or, you know, contribute in some way to, to bring the uh, code up to snuff and, and do what you need it to do. Uh, this held true for us uh, with a library called Cable. Uh, we do a lot of Bluetooth stuff uh, interacting with our apps and our devices. And so we've had to do a couple PRs to, to get Cable into the shape we needed to be in in order to fulfill our use cases. And it's not too bad. Uh, Lastly, if you're just kind of curious about a really good broad list here, uh, this user, Akira, I don't know how to pronounce this, on GitHub um, has curated this great list of multi-platform libraries uh, that fulfill all sorts of different needs. So take a peek at this if you're kind of curious, if your particular um, idea of something that you want to be in KMM is supported by a nice library. Okay, so let's dig into the actual like specifics of some of the different dependencies you might need, some of the different um, sort of uh, needs that you might fulfill in KMM. So number one is testing, right? Of course, we want to test all the code in our common. Uh, so the leading contenders right now for this seem to be Kotlin test. And uh, Kotlin test is the one that's bundled with Kotlin. And then Cotest. Cotest is a, is a fantastic library, uh, really active development, all sorts of different testing styles and uh, different assertions that come with it as well. Uh, with and it has great IDE support. So I think they're all different important things to look out for here. Um, the last one I would say is iteration and cycle time on your tests. You know, of course, different folks have different sort of patterns and uh, processes they follow for how they test and how that's integrated into their development cycle. Uh, but generally, the faster you can iterate on your tests, the better, right? And so I think it's a strong consideration here. Kotlin test is probably the fastest to iterate on. Um, and in our experience, code test is also quite quick. Uh, another test framework that's worth mentioning is spec. So specs maintained uh, by a JetBrains employee, although it's separate technically from JetBrains. And then another useful testing library is mock K for uh, using mocks in unit tests. So another dependency here that you'll commonly need is logging. Uh, Touch Lab has a great library for this called Kermit uh, that allows you to log to Logcat and then it's log. Um, I think some of the things to look out for here are you know, the ability to log to different levels, uh, great logging of, of stack traces for exceptions that crop up. Uh, just so during your development life cycle, you have to go hunting down what those are. Um, custom logger extensibility can be important to some people. You know, like say you're using uh, third-party logging services that send logs to um, augment crash reports or something like that, then being able to add that logging uh, into those services is really nice as well. And then last but not least, uh, lazy execution of your log statements. So you don't want to be logging unnecessarily in production. It can be extra allocations, extra CPU time. Uh, it's just unnecessary. So uh, only doing it when logging is actually enabled is another must in my opinion. So uh, we like Kermit, we've used it and it's worked well for us. Uh, a couple other options in this space are Napier and uh, Kotlin logging. So feel free to check those out. Dependency injection is another big thing, right? Most uh, modern projects these days seem to use dependency injection and for good reason. Uh, some of the things to look out here for are uh, simplicity and power, right? Different DI frameworks come with, uh, a lot of power, but with that comes a lot of sort of responsibility and, and ability to shoot yourselves in the feet. Um, there are also some really simple DI tools that just don't give you the flexibility that some people need. So watch out for that. The amount of boilerplate, I think, is another particular thing to watch out for. Some libraries involve writing a lot more boilerplate than others. 
Uh, and then lastly, consider integration with uh, existing DI frameworks. So this holds especially true if you know, you're working with uh, an existing DI framework in a project that you've started to add KMM to. Like for example, maybe you have an Android project and you use Dagger or Hilt. Uh, you know, Dagger is, is JVM specific. Um, so using it on a shared Kotlin module is just not doable. Um, so interrupting there, you know, there are ways to, to make uh, different DI frameworks sort of live alongside each other in, in harmony uh, with a nice boundary between them. Uh, but some people might not desire to do that and may want to use the same one across. So a couple to consider there are coding and coin. Both of these have been around for quite a long time and uh, have focused on KMM. Dates, times, and durations are another. Um, we actually heavily use this in Parcels app uh, and Kotlin X's date time or Kotlin's Kotlin X daytime letter, sorry, is, is great. Um, hasn't, we haven't had any shortcomings that we've noticed here. So the things that we looked out here or looked out for here were um, ISO 8601 supports, both converting to and from ISO 8601 strings, uh, intuitive and streamlined APIs. Most of these are pretty good nowadays. Uh, and this one is no exception. It's really easy to create different, you know, times, durations, uh, dates, combine them, separate them, things like that. Uh, and then conversion to different units is another one here, right? Like if you have stuff in milliseconds and want to convert it to hours or days and want to convert it to hours or whatever, or, or maybe you want to do um, sort of um, addition or subtraction of durations or durations from times, stuff like that. There's just some nice to have there. So Kotlin X time is our favorite. Uh, CoreLabs Clock is another one that's been around for a really long time and seems widely used as well. Persistence. Uh, so this is a, an interesting one. You know, we, we chose to use uh, multi-platform persistence on our side of the house. Uh, we didn't have anything that led us to not do it. And that said, um, persistence is a really broad topic, right? There are different types of persistence. There's Stuff that's as simple as like key value stores. Um, there's NoSQL and SQL, obviously. Uh, so the type of actual persistence you're after here matters a lot, right? Um, some tools are just not available for multi-platform. Um, others are. Uh, SQL Delight is the one that we chose to use. Uh, we used Room and SQLite on the Android side before that. And of course, iOS supports uh, SQLite as well. SQL Delight is an awesome tool uh, that allows you to very quickly and easily spin up SQL databases, uh, it deals with migrations, all that kind of good stuff. Some other options in this space to consider are Realm, which uh, has been very popular on both Android and iOS. They're starting to get into a multi-platform Kotlin setup. Uh, Codeen, the, the DI framework I mentioned, also has a, a new database thing they're spinning up. Uh, Russ H. Wolf, who I believe works for uh, Touch Lab, has created this multi-platform settings library, which is great for key value stores. And then uh, lastly is Kiss Me, which I believe is also a key value store. So uh, networking is another one of those sort of core, core libraries here that's really important that almost all apps, it seems, um, use. So the option here really is, is KTOR. Um, I think some of the things to consider here are, just despite the lack of options, uh, uh, the surface lack of options here, um, is flexibility of like how the actual HTTP calls are made or the, the, the mechanism or the engine behind them. Uh, which serialization and deserialization you use. There are a multitude of options available here. Uh, clear connection and error handling. You know, some libraries are easier to use here than others. Uh, pick one that suits your app well, you know, that gives, lets you uh, handle connection and uh, error issues easily and transparently. And then lastly, of course, performance is something to consider here. So I don't know of any other great networking options. Um, for KMM. That said, KTOR is really interesting because there is so much flexibility for these things. So you could use, say, um, OKHTTP. Okay you could use a custom coroutines based engine that JetBrains offers. Uh, you can use all sorts of different engines. It's very a very plug and play mechanism um, 
for making the actual HTTP calls. You can sort of think as, of KTOR as a wrapper around a given engine um, and a few of the other aspects like deserialization. So deserialization or serialization is another aspect here that's flexible within KTOR. Um, you know, you can use Kotlin's serialization library. You can use uh, JSON, Jackson, whatever you prefer. Uh, and I find KTOR's connection and error handling nice as well. And so the performance here mostly depends on the, the engine and the serialization, serialization that you're using. Speaking of, uh, our favorite serialization library is the Kotlin X1. Uh, it's worked out very well for us, super easy to use. Uh, it supports different formats we need, including JSON. Uh, it's customizable, so it allows you to do things that are Pretty typical about around most uh, serialization frameworks, like you know, custom names for say JSON fields, stuff like that, as well as defining um, different custom serialization sort of formats or schemes. So, say you have maybe most of your uh, JSON you're getting back from an API is formatted with a certain format, and, and some of it's not, and you need to write some like custom serialization code for some weird edge case, then. Kotlin X serialization allows you to do that in any library you pick should ideally as well. And of course, performance is important here, right? You're making calls and deserializing and serializing data pretty frequently, most likely. Um, one of the other sort of options here, uh, if you use Protobus, then there's a PBNK library out there by this stream. Uh, so look into that if you're using Protobus. IO is another one. Uh, Square is a big player on, on the, the Android side for IO. So they have their OKIO OK library. I think some of the particularly important things here are, again, speed and memory usage. Um, oftentimes you're dealing with like file IO or large pieces of data in memory, um, stuff like that. So you need to make sure that you're keeping number one, um, speed up and, and memory usage low. The last thing to consider there is whether the library supports blocking and non-blocking options. So um, whether you're blocking an entire thread or just a single coroutine running on a thread. And for those that aren't familiar with coroutines, you can have thousands of them running on a single thread. So uh, the whole non-blocking thing becomes more important or um, is easier to do on the Kotlin side. I don't know of any other great options here. Um, I'd love to hear from folks if they know of others, but uh, OKIO has worked out really well for us. UIDs are another one that is uh, fairly frequent. Not everyone uses these, obviously, but um, Ben Asher, who I can't remember, he might be from Square, uh, has a really nice UID library that I think can generate different versions of UIDs. So whether you're looking for one, two, I think three and four are the others, um, this library supports all of them, I believe. And I don't know of any others that do. Uh, Bluetooth, particularly low energy, is one that we care about. I realize not everyone cares about it, but uh, Jewel Labs, they have a fantastic library called Cable. Uh, it's well-architected, uh, performs well. Um, it includes all the necessary functionality as far as uh, scanning for nearby devices, connecting to them, and then some of the interactions you have with devices like reading and writing and observing characteristics. Don't have any other options here as well. Okay, so uh, lastly here, let's get into some best practices and we'll talk about some for both the team perspective and the code perspective. For teams, uh, there's these four. So involve both your Android and iOS developers very early on in the design of your shared code, right? You, the more you're developing and, and talking and thinking in isolation about the design of that shared code, the more likely it is that problems are gonna crop up. This holds true in almost everything we do as developers, right? Like you wouldn't expect to never talk to design or QA um, about, or, or product for that matter, about like how the code you're writing should uh, look and behave and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to rub shoulders and talk with your fellow Android or iOS engineers to make sure that you're designing shared code that is easily usable by both sides of the house. Consider cross-pollination because honestly, um, that can help drive some great design in that shared code, right? And more importantly, it also drives empathy and understanding. Uh, the more empathy there is in situations like this and, and less sort of combativeness there is between the two sides of the house, the better. Uh, 
next, like, you know, you might design your code, but you should also verify early on that like your designs are panning out the way you want them to. So, um, you know, you might design it and think, oh, great, this is going to be super easy to use on both sides of the house. Um, and maybe iOS development doesn't actually start in earnest utilizing KMM code right away. Uh, and then, you know, six months down the line, or maybe about six months, that's really extreme, but say a month or two down the line, um, your iOS engineer to start using the code and they realize like, oh man, this is such a bummer to use. It's super annoying. This is a terrible API. Uh, we would ideally rework this. Well, that likely means then that the Android developers have to go back and, and revisit all the stuff that they wrote for that API. And of course the same would hold true in reverse. So that said, like after you've hopefully done a good job, you know, designing and, and verifying your designs for the shared code, don't be afraid to revisit stuff. If you did something wrong or less than ideally, right? Um, the cost of revisiting those decisions is never going to get lower than it is right now when you're using that code the least and that code is the easiest to change, right? Just like any sort of tech debt here. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now like what about the actual code and design best practices for that kind of stuff? Number one, develop a threading strategy early on. Um, specifically, what I mean here is make sure that you decide whether it's the platform specific code and platform specific modules that de determine which threading um, or which thread rather code runs on, or if you allow your shared modules uh, and your shared code to decide which threads things run on. There are pros and cons depending on the particular project you're on here. So I'm not gonna to try to be prescriptive about you know, which approach you should take there, but um, think about it and apply it to your own project and make the best decision for your team. Of course, when you're dealing with threading, using immutable data structures goes a really long way to making things easier, right? Um, if you don't have multiple threads contending to modify and, and mutate state, it's easier for everyone. So use immutable data structures and pass them around. Uh, to broaden that a little bit more, try to just use more functional programming techniques when they make sense. Um, like for example, pure functions, you know, they tend to make things much easier to reason about in multi-threaded environments and with KMM um, and just mobile programming in general nowadays, multi-threading is obviously uh, a very important concern here. So just consider functional stuff. It can make things easier when you're dealing with all that thread stuff. Um, to touch back on what I talked about before, you know, with the code lives thing, be intentional and strict about this. Like, don't don't be haphazard and just start placing code all over the place. Think about where code should live as a team. You know, talk out loud about that kind of stuff amongst your teammates, teammates, and uh, come up with a plan and and stick to it. This generally helps team members know, like, oh, I can expect this code of this certain type to like have this rough shape and it's probably in this particular location. So if I'm wondering how, you know, maybe this screen achieves some functionality on um, this, this, well, this one screen achieves this particular functionality, I can go look uh, and apply that to my other screen as well, very easily. Of course, this holds true in general for projects, but this is especially true on the K in the KMM world, just because you're now sharing code between two projects. So the benefits you get from doing this well are sort of double. Um, you know, to aid in this too, I think it helps to use convention and tools a lot. Um, they can essentially just help developers make sure that they're doing the right thing more consistently and remove the whole, like, I should do the right thing from the developer's plate. Just make it the default. Use tools that help them to do the right thing by default without having to think about it and just don't worry about it from then on. Don't be afraid to take a little time into doing this. It'll pay huge dividends in the long run if you know you're sticking to KMM. And then lastly, uh, you know, like I mentioned before, don't be afraid to dive into source for third-party libraries, open source, obviously. Um, KMM is in its early days, and uh, usually you'll find that KMM libraries are pretty easy to understand, at least for the particular platform that you're um, really familiar with. Of course, if you're familiar with both, then great. Um, but remember that like the actual code I talked about before is just platform specific code. Like it's still all the same APIs and, and um, platform dependencies that you're used to working with. So looking at the KMM code for that is 
pretty darn intuitive most of the time. Don't be afraid to, to dive in, make those changes to open source libraries if they help you. Um, you know, don't go building up a bunch of tech debt because some little tiny feature uh, wasn't there that you needed and you had to work around it in some weird way. Just implement the feature in the open source library. Give back to the community and you help yourselves at the same time. All right, uh, that is it for me. Uh, I suppose I'll take some questions and comments here. We got about nine minutes left. Uh, of course, if folks have other questions and comments after all this, feel free to email me, I'm mtrewartha at parcel or trewartha.mike at gmail. And I'm happy to answer questions uh, now or over email. All right. Uh, looks like Roger says pros and cons of K members Flutter. Uh, pro I can see is not having to learn a whole new language as of Flutter. Yeah, I would definitely echo that sentiment. Um, Flutter is a really cool tool, but as we all know, Flutter also just tries to like emulate the native UIs that are part of each platform. And it, it works to a degree, right? Um, at least most of us experienced developers and many consumers as well are educated enough to know that like it's, it's not native and it still doesn't feel perfectly native all the time. Um, so number one, I think one pro is, you know, you actually get a true native UI. You're still writing a UI, UI kit or Swift UI or Compose or, or the Android view system. So um, that's the biggest one in my opinion. Uh, the other part is that like, yeah, like you said, you don't have to learn new languages. Your iOS team still gets to use Swift and Objective-C like they always have, you can use either. Um, and on the, the Android side of the house, you can still technically use Java or Kotlin as well. So the learning curve is, is lower because of that. Um, and you just get to stick with the, the language that's, that's native to that particular platform. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we could also debate the merits of Kotlin versus Dart, right? They're sort of different languages at their core. Um, KMM itself, had, or sorry, Flutter uh, has some really cool aspects to it, like Hot Reload and stuff like that. Um, the new UI toolkits and stuff like that for both Android and iOS are aiming to um, implement a lot of that stuff that's really developer friendly about Flutter in the KMM world as well. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I, I would say the biggest thing here is that KMM lets you stick to the native languages for that platform. All right. Anyone else have uh, other questions? All right, cool. Well, let's you folks get back to it. Hope everyone is enjoying Startup Week. And uh, like I said before, if anyone has extra questions that they didn't get to submit here or they need to dive into more technical stuff, uh, feel, feel free to email me at either my work email at mtrewartha at parcel or trewartha.mike at gmail.com. Thank you, everybody.